This episode of Explore Ecstatic Sensuality is entitled Do Not Allow Sex to Ruin Your Self-Esteem. But it might be broadened to say Do Not Allow Sex to Ruin Your Life. It's been known to happen. Now, there are what I'm going to call obvious examples, but we don't think about them and look at them closely enough of people who go through life with a quote-unquote inferiority complex, but it's not in quotes, it's real because of their body shape and type. There are some people who go to extremes in order to reshape their bodies in a way that is supposed to supposedly will make them be more attractive to whatever their sexual preference person is, men or, or women. And the examples of this are sometimes extreme. I heard a story recently, and it's not the first time I've heard this type of story, about a woman whose husband wanted her to have buttocks of a different shape of a shape that he found more attractive and sensual, perhaps among his friends, colleagues, social group. This was the type of buttocks that was admired, whether it was for his sensual purposes. I think that's less than for something that he felt was more attractive. So, she went to another country and had that surgery. It was expensive, The couple needed to forego making a substantial payment on their house. They were in arrears on their mortgage. And if they did not make this payment, they were very likely to lose their home. But the husband said, go and do it anyway. The surgery went wrong and the woman died. And this is not the first story along these lines that I've heard. Think about it. This relates, of course, to issues of misogyny, a regular theme of these podcasts, and the extremity to which misogyny goes in relationships. And when women commit themselves to the tyranny of a man who insists that they do something like this for his ego, probably, who knows for what, it seems like sickness to me. It's just unendurable to think about. It is a truism that in relationships, one partner or the other, or sometimes both, spend a great deal of energy attempting to tear their partners down and harm their partners in various ways, emotionally, physically, The type of example that we just quoted, there's so many similar ones where the man tries to get the woman to change her body. But there are similar examples in which the man attempts to get the woman to change her behavior. The man manipulates the woman, for example, into doing something sexually that she really does not want to do. And I'll give you one type of example that I've heard back from a couple of listeners to this podcast and also from discussing instances like this with people I know personally. And that is where where the man, the husband, we'll call him in the situation, although he does not necessarily have to be a husband, the husband slowly sets a situation up in which the wife is put into a position in which she is expected to sleep with a friend of his for whatever reason, or sets up a situation in which a swapping situation is being imposed on the woman by the man. This sort of thing happens all the time. Of course, this is in addition to the usual thing you see, and thank goodness it is displayed more and portrayed more in books and films and television and those things, streaming, where we see 
a man in a relationship constantly abusing the wife verbally, telling her that she's stupid, telling her that she's ugly, as if the whole purpose of the relationship is to belittle her. We've talked about this in other episodes of this podcast, in which a man feels so downtrodden in his life, in his in his office, I was just going to say it, doesn't, not just offices, in his job, in everything about his life, he feels so pressured. He feels pressured by everything, pressured by bills, pressured by other members of his family, his parents, his siblings, and he takes all that out on the woman. And somehow he feels better. Somehow he feels better because he's put the woman down because he's destroyed her ego, he feels like this is part of what it is to be a real man. I may not have anything in my life. I may not have any status. I may be the lowest guy on the totem pole where I work. I may get insulted by my boss all day long. I may be desperate to hang on to my job in an Amazon warehouse, afraid every minute that I'm going to be fired, but at least I'm the master of my house. And women put up with this. Women put up with this. And I repeat the title of this podcast. Do not allow sex. And I extend this here to mean relationships. Do not allow sex to ruin your self-esteem. Do not allow the things that you are supposed to do sexually because your mate insists on them to ruin your self-esteem. distressing and disturbing. And people spend their lifetimes like this. Men spend their lifetimes, I'm told, being incredibly self-conscious and in some cases not able to express themselves sexually to act on their sexuality because they feel that they are, what's the expression, not well endowed, not well hung. Again, it's not something that that I can say, okay, personally I'm this way and I understand how these people feel. But on the other hand, well, I have to put myself into that feeling of having so, such self-consciousness and that self-consciousness can lead to a form of self-loathing even more than low self-esteem or damage to self-esteem. It can result in serious self-loathing. And self-loathing is not a place where you want to be. It simply isn't. It simply isn't. And you got to get out of it. Now, I think it's true that sexuality is a very important part of life. As I mentioned a moment ago, there are some people for whom sexuality is central to their lives and their being and their feeling about themselves. Is this because at some deep level they feel questions about their sexuality? They're uncomfortable with their sexuality and therefore they have to make their entire lives about sex? I don't know. Whether that one's sexuality drives one's life in a certain way, as a man, as my uh, creative and business uh, work and aggressiveness, if you want to call it that, is that driven by testosterone? I don't even stop to think about it. I suppose it is. I suppose hormones and all these sorts of things really do pull the strings at a certain level. But so does all kinds of stuff. Society pulls our strings more strongly than hormones do. Society is always pulling our strings. Society, again, it's a cliche, but society is always throwing up impossible images that we are supposed to look up to, that we are supposed to envy, that we are supposed to imagine ourselves as inferior to, or we are told that we need to spend a lot of money and a lot of time making pathetic efforts to live up to these images that are constantly being thrown at us. We feel that we are undesirable, not only just by the sex that interests us, but undesirable in general undesirable in society, low self-esteem. And this is horrible. This is really horrible. And again, this business of sexuality being at the center of one's lives, there are sex addicts out there, that's for sure. No question, that's for sure. There are sex addicts 
whose addiction makes them do violent things to whatever gender they're inclined to do violent things to. Women, sex addicts are often abusers of women, either if they're in relationships or otherwise. Happens all the time. There are gay people who are sex addicts as well. Before we dive into the meat, is that a mixed metaphor? I'm a vegetarian. Before we dive into the meat of today's episode, I want to say one more thing on how sex can ruin your self-esteem. I will be referring to these podcast episodes again very shortly. But even before we dive into that, I want to say something extremely important. I did episodes on the subject of attraction, and I did an episode on the subject of infatuation. And again, as I'll mention in another moment, those episodes were extremely popular. People identified with those. But more about that in just a moment. So, one way that you can make yourself and other people really miserable, and one way that you can really have your self-esteem trashed and bashed and thrown on the junk pile, not even in the recycle bin, if I may be so bold as to say, is the following. Remember this adage. Infatuation does not impose an obligation on the other party. Janine's infatuation with Enrique does not impose an obligation on Enrique. There is no imposition. Infatuation, love of this variety, unreturned love, love with a party who is not interested in your love, does not impose any obligation whatsoever on that person. To state this another way, because it most definitely bears repeating. Infatuation does not confer an obligation. One-sided love does not confer an obligation. What do I mean by that? It means that if you are infatuated with someone, they are under no obligation to respond in any way way, size, shape, or form. Unless you become obnoxious about it, unless you become obsessed about it, and if you do, they have every right to ostracize you from their lives and worse. They can do anything that they wish to do. They are under no obligation even to be kind if you take your infatuation, your limerence, your obsession too far if you act with them or against them in any fashion which violates their space, which embarrasses them, which creates for them any problem whatsoever. So I repeat, infatuation, one-sided love, neither of these, and in a certain way they both mean something very similar, confer any obligation on the object of your infatuation or your one-sided love. Remember that. If you go through life having these unrequited infatuations, unrequited loves, and nothing ever happens with those loves, they're impossible. The person on the other side has signaled to you, either subtly or not so subtly, that no, that person is out of your league. That happens all the time. It's nice when someone says to you, hasn't happened to me, but I can imagine someone saying, I've had guys tell me this. Well, you know, uh, I was hanging out with her, but then after a while she told me that she was out of my league. She told me that she was out of my league. I'm not the kind of guy that she hangs out with. She hangs out with handsome, muscular surfers who uh, jet around the world, powerfully built Austrian lawyers, whatever is her, her choice. And, you know, here I am, this kind of ordinary schlub, and... Why didn't I simply understand that? I'm not the kind of guy for her. But, you know, people go through long periods of time with these kind of obsessions. 
They feel that if they only wait long enough, she or he or he goes for both genders, will begin to feel the same way. Another thing that we have said repeatedly in this podcast series is that if there's no Zaza Zoom, which has become our code word for a physical feeling on the part of the other person, the other person can feel affectionate. The other person can feel that you have some kind of nice bond that you can relate over a wide range of subjects and issues. But that, whatever connection that is, is never going to be in the bedroom or anywhere close to the bedroom. And if you keep thinking that, well, this is going to end up in the bedroom one of these days, he is going to realize that I am the girl for him. It's just obvious. I mean, we spend such wonderful time together and the uh, the other girls he goes out with are so trivial and they're, how can he possibly be interested in sleeping with them rather than with me? Here I am. I understand him. Head to toe. Stem to stern. Eh, ain't gonna happen. We're going to be doing an episode on mantras, amongst other things, very shortly, but in a certain way, good mantra is know your place. Know your place with respect to people like that. They're not going to change. They're not going to change. You're going to get more and more miserable over the course of time. Whoops. <laughs> Here comes another one of your host's trademark divigations. Actually, I got into the habit from watching films by my favorite filmmaker, Lars von Trier, and uh, particularly his film Nymphomaniac, in which there's a long digression by a character named Seligman, with whom I very much identify, on the subject of the cake fork. So this divigation, this digression, if you will, is on the subject of what we've been talking about, uh, people who see sex as the center of their lives, and somehow that sexual fulfillment, that identification, that finding the correct sexual identity, the correct sexual persona, the correct sexual expression, will somehow open doors for them in their lives, not in the sense of, oh, it's going to get me a great new career or something like that. No, it's going to suddenly open up new possibilities for them or cure them of their actual or supposed neuroses or even psychoses, if you want to say that, even. And that's okay. I appreciate that. But what comes to my mind is that, for a lot of people, to state the obvious, religion is supposed to do the same thing. That's why people put religion in the center of their lives. It's going to redefine everything. It's going to give them a soteriology. Soteriology reminds me of the Egyptian pharaoh, Hellenic, Egyptian pharaoh, Ptolemy Soter, Ptolemy the Savior. Soterology is the science of what? The science of salvation, actually. That somehow sex will be your salvation. Religion, one way or another, even if you call it nirvana, it's still s salvation. The saner religions, to the extent that there, that there are any, maybe Judaism, I think, is not so much attuned to this notion, doesn't promise you salvation, but so many religions promise you salvation. So the comparison of sex and people who put sex in the middle of their lives and expect to be fulfilled and saved, if only saved internally from their demons, that's the greatest salvation of all, of course, and it's called psychoanalysis. You want salvation? Be saved from your internal demons, which are generally things that you have repressed into down into your id and bring them out into your ego and become sane that way. Those are your demons, and that is your fucking salvation. But, again, to state the obvious, this is something that people do. Put religion in the center of their lives, put sex in the center of their lives, and then nowadays you see them putting both together. And what do I think about that? What do I think about that? Putting religious trappings, if you can say that, on sexuality. Bringing to it a lot of terminology and concepts drawn in from a number of different places. 
syncretically, syncretistically, from a number of different, different sources. Is this to justify sexual behavior, which we would otherwise feel bad about, to give it a bunch of words? I suspect that for some people that's what the purpose of it is. We've been brought up thinking that sex is bad in one way or the other, or sex is dangerous one way or the other. Well, sure it is. It can cause pregnancy, and you can get diseases from sexuality. And then they try to do things, and we are going to be talking about this in our very next episode, trying to, for example, tell men, well, they're not supposed to have orgasm, uh, meaning that they're supposed to hold their seed and all that sort of stuff. And again, that's for the next episode. But even when you get into things like Tantra, which has a solid foundation in sexuality and sensuality going back to the 5th or 6th centuries at least. And then you say, wait a minute, whoa Nelly, the guy's not supposed to ejaculate. I don't know, I don't put it down, but I also wonder what the general idea of it is. What thought is behind that? Before we dive into the meat, is that a mixed metaphor? I'm a vegetarian. Before we dive into the meat of today's episode, I want to say one more thing on how sex can ruin your self-esteem. I will be referring to these podcast episodes again very shortly, but even before we dive into that, I want to say something extremely important. I did episodes on the subject of attraction, and I did an episode on the subject of infatuation. And again, as I'll mention in another moment, those episodes were extremely popular. People identified with those. But more about that in just a moment. So one way that you can make yourself and other people really miserable, and one way that you can really have your self-esteem trashed and bashed and thrown on the junk pile, not even in the recycle bin, if I may be so bold as to say, is the following. Remember this adage. Infatuation does not impose an obligation on the other party. Janine's infatuation with Enrique does not impose an obligation on Enrique. There is no imposition. Infatuation, love of this variety, unreturned love, love with a party who is not interested in your love, does not impose any obligation whatsoever on that person. To state this another way, because it most definitely bears repeating. Infatuation does not confer an obligation. One-sided love does not confer an obligation. What do I mean by that? It means that if you are infatuated with someone, they are under no obligation to respond in any way, size, shape, or form. Unless you become obnoxious about it, unless you become obsessed about it, and if you do, they have every right to ostracize you from their lives and worse. They can do anything that they wish to do. They are under no obligation even to be kind if you take your infatuation, your limerence, your obsession too far if you act with them or against them in any fashion which violates their space, which embarrasses them, which creates for them any problem whatsoever. So I repeat, infatuation, one-sided love, neither of these, and in a certain way they both mean something very similar, confer any obligation on the object of your infatuation or your one-sided love. Remember that. If you go through life having these 
unrequited infatuations, unrequited loves. And nothing ever happens with those loves. They're impossible. The person on the other side has signaled to you, either subtly or not so subtly, that no, that person is out of your league. That happens all the time. It's nice when someone says to you, hasn't happened to me, but I can imagine someone saying, I've had guys tell me this. Well, you know, uh, I was hanging out with her, but then after a while she told me that she was out of my league. She told me that she was out of my league. I'm not the kind of guy that she hangs out with. She hangs out with handsome, muscular surfers who uh, jet around the world, powerfully built Austrian lawyers, whatever is her, her choice. And, you know, here I am, this kind of ordinary schlub, and why didn't I simply understand that I'm not the kind of guy for her? But, you know, people go through long periods of time with these kind of obsessions. They feel that if they only wait long enough, she or he or he, goes for both genders, will begin to feel the same way. Another thing that we have said repeatedly in this podcast series is that if there's no Zaza Zoom, which has become our code word for a physical feeling on the part of the other person. The other person can feel affectionate. The other person can feel that you have some kind of nice bond that you can relate over a wide range of subjects and issues. But that, whatever connection that is, is never going to be in the bedroom or anywhere close to the bedroom. And if you keep thinking that, well, this is going to end up in the bedroom one of these days, he is going to realize that I am the girl for him. It's just obvious. I mean, we spend such wonderful time together, and the uh, the other girls he goes out with are so trivial, and they're, how can he possibly be interested in sleeping with them rather than with me? Here I am. I understand him head to toe, stem to stern. Eh, ain't going to happen. We're going to be doing an episode on mantras amongst other things, very shortly. But in a certain way, a good mantra is know your place. Know your place with respect to people like that. They're not going to change. They're not going to change. You're going to get more and more miserable over the course of time. Whoops. (laughs) Here comes another one of your host's trademark divigations. Actually, I got into the habit from watching films by my favorite filmmaker, Lars von Trier, and uh, particularly his film Nymphomaniac, in which there's a long digression by a character named Seligman, with whom I very much identify, on the subject of the cake fork. So this divigation, this digression, if you will, is on the subject of what we've been talking about, uh, people who see sex as the center of their lives, and somehow that sexual fulfillment, that identification, that finding the correct sexual identity, the correct sexual persona, the correct sexual expression, will somehow open doors for them in their lives, not in the sense of, oh, it's going to get me a great new career or something like that. No, it's going to suddenly open up new possibilities for them or cure them of their actual or supposed neuroses or even psychoses, if you want to say that, even. And that's okay. I appreciate that. But what comes to my mind is that, for a lot of people, to state the obvious, religion is supposed to do the same thing. That's why people put religion in the center of their lives. It's going to redefine everything. It's going to give them a soteriology. Soteriology reminds me of the Egyptian pharaoh, Hellenic, Egyptian pharaoh, Ptolemy Soter, Ptolemy the Savior. Soterology is the science of what? The science of salvation, actually. That somehow sex will be your salvation. Religion, one way or another, even if you call it nirvana, it's still salvation. The saner religions, to the extent that there there are any, maybe Judaism, I think, is not so much attuned to this notion, doesn't promise you salvation, but so many religions promise you salvation. So the comparison of sex and people who put sex in the middle of their lives and expect to be fulfilled and saved 
if only saved internally from their demons. That's the greatest salvation of all, of course, and it's called psychoanalysis. You want salvation? Be saved from your internal demons, which are generally things that you have repressed into down into your id and bring them out into your ego and become sane that way. Those are your demons, and that is your fucking salvation. But, again, to state the obvious, this is something that people do. Put religion in the center of their lives, put sex in the center of their lives, and nowadays you see them putting both together. And what do I think about that? What do I think about that? Putting religious trappings, if you can say that, on sexuality bringing to it a lot of terminology and concepts drawn in from a number of different places, syncretically, syncretistically, from a number of different, different sources. Is this to justify sexual behavior, which we would otherwise feel bad about, to give it a bunch of words? I suspect that for some people that's what the purpose of it is. We've been brought up thinking that sex is bad in one way or the other, or sex is dangerous one way or the other. Well, sure it is. It can cause pregnancy, and you can get diseases from sexuality. And then they try to do things, and we are going to be talking about this in our very next episode, trying to, for example, tell men, well, they're not supposed to have orgasm Uh, meaning that they're supposed to hold their seed and all that sort of stuff. And again, that's for the next episode. But even when you get into things like Tantra, which has a solid foundation in sexuality and sensuality going back to the 5th or 6th centuries at least, and then you say, wait a minute, whoa, Nelly, the guy's not supposed to ejaculate. I don't know, I don't put it down, but I also wonder what the general idea of it is. What thought is behind that? At any rate, this is my preamble to an episode that's going to talk about lots of different things and take lots of different views of the routes in life that people follow and the way that they can go downhill in their lives go downhill in their sense of what is possible for them, go downhill in their ideas about the future, go downhill in their aspirations, go downhill in their creativity, go downhill and become, in some cases, isolates. They're scared. They're afraid to go out there because they feel so bad about themselves. And in so many cases, this is because they have allowed sex to ruin their self-esteem. One of the things that happens when you are the host and producer of a successful podcast like this one is that you receive feedback and responses to some of your episodes. In fact, most of your episodes... What is particularly gratifying, at least for me, is when someone writes me, messages me, yeah, that's exactly how I feel. I went through a very similar experience. How do you know that? That sounds like my life. Bizarre. You're talking, you could be talking about me. So I go back and I start to think, which of my episodes has evoked the greatest degree of audience response? And I notice that some topics keep coming through as being particularly interesting to those who listen to this podcast. And I will say, one of the episodes, for instance, that I get a lot of response on, positive, is attraction. What is attraction between people? What constitutes it? What is the reaction to attraction? And then going along with that is limerence, infatuation. What are the various states of infatuation? What can infatuation do to you? What is the mechanics, the orchestration of infatuation between 
two people, which sometimes works out not very, very well. Other episodes that come to mind as evoking a lot of response are my episodes on cheating. And another episode that gets a lot of response in various ways is my episode on casual sex. And finally, my episode on love and pain. Oh my goodness, people listen to that and they say, that's exactly me, that's what's happened to me. I told the story of an acquaintance of mine, not really a friend, and I had not heard from him in a long time. But his story, in brief, was that he lived in Washington, D.C. He met a woman somehow online, I think, maybe not quite that way. And there was this immediate situation where she was really interested in my friend, and my friend fell like, A ton of bricks, whatever, there must be a cliche for that, all the way, instantly. And she was really on top of him, all over him like a cheap suit. I think there's a less polite way of expressing that same sort of thing, but that was okay. He responded to this positively. They had a lot of things in common. I won't go back to what those things were, but a lot of things in common, and they spoke for hours and hours on Skype and on Zoom, and on every other kind of way, just by telephone, whatever was available every night, they talked and talked. And one thing about her, I should say right off, is that he lived in Washington, D.C., did I say that before? And she lived in London. So the whole deal was that he was going to move to London, hopefully find a job in his field, which he wasn't quite sure about, you know, given that he was an American, all kinds of problems with, with that. So he, in fact did move to London. They found a place to live, and they talked about this a lot. They'd gone, you know, flat hunting in various parts of London. And finally, six weeks after he's there in London, having, let's let's just say, taken a financial loss in the process of moving in a lot of ways, and she says, we have to talk This isn't working. We have to talk. Remember when people have said that to you in relationships? Many people have heard that. I may be the rare exception. We have to talk. What's going to follow that? We have to talk. This isn't working. This isn't working. An expression that uh, we've talked about in previous episodes of this podcast, this isn't working famous words. This isn't working. And he just sits there. What else was he supposed to do? He sits there and and she says it again, this isn't working. And she doesn't get terribly specific about things. And if she did, my acquaintance did not explicate what those ways were. But at the end of the conversation, she said to him, my acquaintance, no woman will ever find you satisfactory. Then my acquaintance had a little memory lapse. It's the it's kind of situation where you can't quite bear keeping certain words in your mind. If you do, they echo back and forth, and you can't get rid of them. And he said, well, maybe what she said was, no woman will ever find you acceptable. He couldn't tell. But that made him think about it even more, going back and forth as to what she really said on that morning in London, England. And I don't think a lot of people want to hear that. I don't think a lot of men want to hear that. I don't think a lot of women want to hear that. That's pretty devastating, as statements go. So, the end of that story, I don't don't need to go into it any farther than that, except that was the story. And when people heard that story on my episode on love and pain, it was like a floodgate opened up with people with similar stories. Mostly, interestingly enough, women 
Oh, I had a great job in San Diego in biological medical research, and I met this guy, and we spent a lot of time in in San Diego, and it was like a big romance, you know. But uh, he lived in Charleston, South Carolina, and that's where he, you know, had his job or his business. I forget. It's not my business to share with you uh, what this woman who contacted me said. And then as soon as she arrived, Things weren't at all. Things weren't at all as he had depicted them. Well, actually, his divorce wasn't really, really finalized, hadn't been. And on top of that, there was a big custody deal in which he was fighting for the custody of two early teenage boys. I think one was 12, about to turn 13. The other was... 14 or 15 and this woman said I wasn't prepared for any of this I wasn't prepared for his drug use which is did not entail uh, shooting anything up quote unquote but he was a uh, a crack if not addict the person who used crack cocaine a lot everything was different everything And she had given up her entire life, her friends, some of whom were very much against her relationship with this guy. And she'd given up everything to move to Charleston, South Carolina, and there she was, stuck. Oh, man, stories like this kept kept coming through. People who had given up things for a relationship with someone who turned out to be not what they appeared to be. Both women and men. A friend of mine was here this morning. We were talking about various things, and she had just read a article. Let me make sure I understand that this. Yeah, in the New Yorker, and it was an article about the critic and writer Elizabeth Hardwick, partially about her relationship with poet with the poet Robert Lowell, who was like many poets of his generation, a really really big drinker. And they had this kind of off-again, on-again relationship for a long time. It's another kind of situation where you feel that a woman is latching onto or being latched onto in a situation where she is having to put up with someone. And, of course, the worst kind of situation is where women realize having given up everything, having ditched, in a lot of cases, even their friends, and finding that they're with a with a man who is violent. Yeah, it happens all the time. It's scary. It's horrible. Or a man who is so into his little group of male friends and hobbies that suddenly, while he was all kinds of romantic in the visiting situation and visiting the city where the woman lives, once she arrives in his domain, in his bailiwick, where he has everything. His life is very much set. He has his own friends and their activities, and they do stuff. Women are not a part of this, and this takes up a huge portion of his life. And it turns out that unlike the kind of romantic situation that they'd had when it was a visiting kind of a, kind of a deal, basically she becomes the person who cleans the house, washes the clothes, dishes, whatever, takes care of car repairs and blah, 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 things along those lines. But as far as he's concerned, she's there for sex. Sex and housework. In other words, she becomes, even if they're not married yet, a wife, W-I-F-E. And how many times is being a wife something that elevates one's self-esteem? We're hitting at the topic of this episode. How many times does a relationship promote one's self-esteem, one's expansion as a person, one's development, one's ambitions, one's vision of what life should be, one's creativity, a word that we use a lot in this podcast. How often does that happen particularly for a woman, but also for a man. It's scary to think about. It's scary. 
So we asked the question, as is the topic, indeed, the clickbait title <laughs> of this podcast, do not allow sex to destroy your self-esteem. It's so, so important. It's so, so important. One thing I'm going to bring up now is that they used to have something called dating. I have uh, a, a woman friend who is uh, considerably older. I mean, I'm still on the junior side of 40, but I do have some friends uh, considerably older, which is a good thing. I, therefore, I can learn about their world and their ways of looking at things. And she was trying to do something, write a book or do a television or movie project about uh, the dating rituals of the American male. And you have a whole bunch of men in some kind of group, psychotherapy group, whatever, talking about their um, involvement in dating women. And, wow, you know, dating is, is sort of not a term. They don't do it anymore. For the last 20 years, I would say, hookup culture is basically what dominates the entire area of what used to be called dating. People don't date, they hook up. This is what happens on college campuses where it began. And then after the phenomenon of college campuses, it actually began to expand farther into the population, the part of the percentage of the population which does not attend college, which is considerable. And so now we're in the in the world of hookup culture. And dating, as I understood it, well, you know, people go out and they have conversations. They talk about stuff. Or, I mean, it, even if they go to a movie or, you know, whatever, which, you know, precludes in, so, theoretically the need to have any kind of conversation or intellectual or personal interaction or sharing interaction of thoughts and feelings and beliefs and those sorts of things. In hookup culture, the whole idea is that it is about sex. When people hook up, the understanding is that sex is the goal. Sex is the goal. And then, you know, if you hook up, some hookups end up in a kind of uh, a fuck buddy sort of relationship uh, in which the two people, yeah, they get together frequently, but often one of the, or the other of them leaves and doesn't end up spending the entire night. There is a deliberate effort not to have conversations that are in any way relationship-oriented. And sometimes, you know, there's affection that happens, but it's very much circumscribed. It's very much defined by this notion of the impermanence, the lack of commitment, that old-fashioned word again, a word that sometimes is heard nowadays, but it's a, it has a kind of different meaning that, than it did uh, in my opinion, looking back in time to a previous generation, than it did even 20 years ago. And in hookups, one of the things that is expected, I wouldn't say expected, one of the things that research tells us, I love research. In my episode on casual sex, I did a huge amount of research and spoke to any number of authorities and read any number of psychological studies. And you can listen to that episode and realize how in-depth it is and was. But in hookup situations, it is generally anticipated that if the woman does not give the man oral sex on the first encounter, the first hookup, then if there's a subsequent hookup, that is definitely expected. And then, if any other kind of sex transpires, that's a whole other deal. And again, it's a subject of negotiation. As many studies have, have indicated, something over 73% of women do not experience orgasm through penetration sex alone. They need something else. They need cunnilingus. 
they need to perhaps even masturbate themselves in order to, to prepare themselves for penetration and then bring themselves to the point that they are ready to experience orgasm so that that's somehow timed with the penetration and the rhythm of that or the the clockwork of that operation but that's the modern way that's the current way that's what happens curious curious deal so the question inevitably arises as to in this current situation in which the typical hookup event context either for the first hookup with a person or the second hookup with a person is that the guy gropes the woman for a while and this helps him get hard and most men are not great gropers from what women tell me they are really not we talk about sensuality here in this podcast it's the theme but a lot of people, particularly men, are not great sensualists, which means that they're not great gropers. What do I mean by gropers? Groping means feeling a woman's body in a way that is pleasing for her, that gives her pleasure, that gets her excited in a certain way. But is that really the goal? I don't know. It's sort of a mutual pleasure sort of situation, or should be. But for the average commoner garden variety guy, it's more about I'm going to do what I need to do to get hard. So he gets hard and then the woman in question gives him a blowjob. And that's basically the situation on hookup number two with the same person. Again, the research says, well, men and women enjoy their hookups, etc., etc., but one asks, you know, what does the woman get out of that? How much does the woman enjoy giving a guy a blowjob? If it's outside of the context of mutual eroticism, what if the situation is that he's actually... I'm going to use the word grope because the word grope seems highly applicable and takes all of the mystery and sensuality out of the whole thing. So if a man has groped her, the man who's there with her has groped her and turned her on to a certain extent and then she gives him oral sex, how satisfied is she? You know, again, the research says, well, the people enjoy hookups like this, but you ask yourself, really? Is she left frustrated? Is she left fulfilled? Fulfilled in this kind of, kind of deal? Is she thinking that maybe he should leave really pretty soon so I can finish myself off? If I had been with Sally, the girl down the hall, who is rumored and more than rumored to have women lovers, more than one, who are very attractive and always smile when they come and go, could Sally have uh, done a, be a better job than Ed, monosyllabic Ed? These are questions to ask. And yet, this is the format, this is the framework, this is the scenario, this is the outline for hookup sex today, for the type of sex that has replaced the dating ritual today. Let us, as an experiment, adjust the scenario a little bit. And in this scenario the man actually reciprocates the oral sex which has been administered onto him by the woman. Carlingus. This is, in some instances, a subject of negotiation between the couple. And we talked about this on our episode on the subject of casual sex. And uh, some women are quite 
overt about it. Articles in blogs for women and books for women about being a single woman and getting what she wants. Such books and blogs and articles have specified that this is a type of negotiation and sometimes the, the woman is advised saying no, 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 unless the man reciprocates. We're not necessarily discussing sex in the 69 position, which has its virtues and its faults, but that's for another episode. So the question arises as to the competence of men to satisfy women orally through cunnilingus. And again, this requires more research. It's not just a question of asking college students, women college students, well, how often do your boyfriends offer to do this, or how often do you have to twist their arms and threaten them with some terrible violence, like next time you're not going to open the door for them. Maybe not quite that bad. What is that negotiation process, and then what is the competence of the man? Well, where do men learn about sex? A whole other stupid question that's been researched up the wazoo from other guys. Some men are very smart, and they actually talk to women that they're not going to have physicality with, and those women can be very helpful. Some men are really smart, and they talk with bisexual or lesbian women in their own age group or whatever with whom they have social context. And those are really smart men because the bisexual or lesbian women are very likely to give them better advice on how to go down on a woman, as, as they'd say. But a lot of men simply don't know how to do it. At one time, examples and illustrations of men pleasuring women orally were quite rare and difficult to encounter. One fairly early example is the 1988 film And God Created Woman. In this film, the female star, Rebecca de Mornay, quite remarkable actress and producer, was pleasured by Frank Langella, a marvelous actor. This film, In God Created Woman, the 1988 version, was directed, as was the original version, by my friend, the well-known French writer, director, and artist, and occasional actor, Roger Vadim. And I have to tell you, in my not that many encounters, but in my encounters with Roger Vadim, I learned a lot about why he was so successful in his life with women all of whom loved him and appreciated him dearly. You want some examples? Catherine Deneuve, by whom he had a child, Brigitte Bardot, Jane Fonda, Marine Christine Barreau. Roger's eldest daughter told Jane Fonda's biographer that Jane was the love of her father's life. What Roger had was charm, immense charm. He was fun and a delight to be with. Everything about him was totally engaging and wonderful. Fine, fine man whom I miss. If I was looking for ways to charm women, and, you know, we all are as, as guys, Roger was such a wonderful example. We were going to do a film with him, but somehow he went off to do another project, which was really kind of sad. How many women fake orgasms when the guy's down there lapping away and hasn't the least idea what a clitoris is, hasn't the least idea what a strategy? There is a strategy of approaching that, approaching the entire process. Some men go right down to the heart of the matter, let's call it, too fast. And that, in a certain way, blows the whole deal for the woman in a lot of cases. Some cases, no. But in a lot of cases, it does. The question then arises, what is the poor guy to do? And before I ask that question, I'm just simply going to say, so much research is on college students. And college students are more willing to experiment in you know, that kind of a deal. And for older men, given a whole sorts of so whole range of dynamics. An older 
somewhat older man, 30, God, that's old, 35, Jesus, takes a woman out for a $200 dinner, which now costs $400, and so much for those $200 dinner dates that some men used to think were going to buy them some sex. You know, then he goes back to the woman's place, and he's got his condom at the ready, but is the woman really going to be interested in having full-scale penetration sex with him? Does she want to get rid of him as soon as she can? That happens in some cases. But does this older guy, assuming that the woman he's been out with, taken out to dinner, if she indeed performs oral sex on him, is he going to then turn around and do it to her? I suspect the young people are more willing and more interested in experimenting with that. However, there are some YouTube videos. You know, you can find a YouTube video on how to do just about anything, which is scary if you look at it in a certain way. This podcast is also on YouTube, so bear that in mind. Jeepers, the things that you can find out how to do on a YouTube how-to video. When it comes right down to it, when push comes to shove, and neither pushing nor shoving is particularly good when one is performing cunnilingus on a woman. Take my word for it. There are some videos that are kind of good, and I've watched a couple just, of course, as part of my research. I don't know. They don't strike me as particularly good. I don't know, because there's no real sensuality in the thing. It's that no one describes how to make this conceivably sloppy kind of activity also romantic and thoroughly sensual in a way that's done with total respect for the woman, respect for her body. When a man is performing cunnilingus on a woman, he has to have immaculate respect for her body, immaculate sensitivity to her response to everything. And that goes for just about every kind of sexual or sensual encounter between a woman and a man, the man needs to have a maximum sensitivity. And it has to be kind of like a feedback loop, as we'd say in electronics. It moves around the circle. There's this kind of feedback loop where each side, each side's pleasure feeds back into the other, and they amplify. They oscillate in, in just the right way. But a man going down there in the, the nether regions has just got to feel it. He doesn't want to be in a situation, he shouldn't want to be in a situation where the woman, as I mentioned ago, fakes an orgasm during cunnilingus. That's just terrible. I once had a woman lover, and I'm not going to say she was bisexual because the term gets a little bit weird. I mean, this was a woman who has had sex with women in certain contexts. I don't believe that any of those contexts resulted in anything which might be called a relationship or a steady deal. I may be wrong about that. But I once asked her, just for the hell of it, I asked her, well, you know, who is better at going down on a woman, pleasuring a woman orally, women or men? And she kind of thought for a minute, and she said, well... You may think that women know everything, but women are so used to pleasuring themselves that when they're doing the same thing with their their lips and, and tongues down there, they don't really necessarily know how to do that. Some of the things that they do are more like the motions that they do with their with their fingers when, while they're masturbating. So it's not the same deal, necessarily. She was left sort of not having a conclusive answer for me. I think the deal was that some some women who had had a lot of sexual encounters of this variety with other women, and again, who were really, really into getting the feedback. If you're in something like this and it's a conquest situation, and believe you me, as our previous research has indicated in our episode on casual sex and otherwise, sex between women can be a conquest situation and often is just as much as sex between a man and a woman. So if 
a woman has been conquered, seduced by another woman, the other woman may not necessarily be thinking about so much pleasuring the woman whom she has gotten to agree to have sex with her. The whole idea of the woman having power, power, that's the deal. Conquest and power are interesting things when you talk about sexuality. And we make certain assumptions about conquest and that type of deal, conquest and power, conquest and power, and how those notions interfere or can interfere with the enjoyment of sexual activity. They can, you know. What does this have to do with ruining your self-esteem? Well, there are several different sides to self-esteem. Now, I'm going to I'm going to state the I'm going to state the biggest cliche that has ever been stated, and that is that some people, men in particular, but also women, derive a great deal of their self-esteem from making conquests. Women conquer men. Women conquer other women the whole kind of deal. So where is that sensitivity? Where is this notion of pleasuring someone? Can I conquer you and pleasure you at the same time? And men are going to say, sure. You know, and it's never been quite that way with me. Big, big confession. Big, big confession. I've been seduced. It's fun. It's fun. It's like, what? I was in a long relationship with someone, maybe more than one, where I was seduced. That was fine. I had no problem with that. I didn't feel that I'd lost anything. The woman was ready at a certain point. She knew that she was ready. She asserted her interest at exactly the right time. I was ready for that to, to happen. There was no issue of a power play on either side. So these are some asides. These are a few thoughts on this whole business of cunnilingus and where it fits into the type of hookup sex pattern that we're seeing more than ever that began in colleges and now is spread through society like a wildfire. To pull the zipper up on this brief divigation on the matter of women administering what is supposed to be pleasure with regard to a men's member, utilizing their mouth, tongue, and lips, and possibly also their fingers. I think fingers are essential on the scrotum. I've been told this, and I've been told also that women have been known during this process of oral stimulation of a man's member to insert lubrication, of course, being necessary, a finger in the man's anus. This has been known to happen, and this has been known to create in a man what is less akin to a mere ejaculation situation and is more close to, is closer to an orgasm. Curious, a curious deal. We'll have to deal with this in a subsequent episode. And back to pulling the zipper up on this type of activity. In a situation I have been told and noticed and also read in my research that this type of sexual activity on the part of women going down on a man, giving a man a blowjob, has become a unit of exchange in sexual behavior, not only in sexual behavior, but in social behavior by women. Women tell me things. I think it has to do with the fact that I am, in a certain way, although I did psychological research, I am a closet psychoanalyst. It's funny. I've had three close women in my life. One was already a psychologist and a, psych a psychotherapist, I should also say, and two became such after knowing me. Maybe they thought they needed to cure me of something. <laughs> Women love to fix men, a topic for another episode. Or we've been told that women love to fix men. It's kind of a myth. But to pull the zipper up on this range of subject matter, 
the uh, the blowjob has become, as I mentioned a moment ago, a unit of exchange. So we have women talking to me and saying things like, well, a man I know who was an important banker associated with my business, whatever that business might be, fashion or uh, some other business, I forget, there's some uh, insurance or whatever, or some creative business, some online business that she wanted to advance herself in or make contacts in that might be important for her. And she said to me, well, you know, in this kind of situation, this guy has invited me to, to dinner, but I think um, the expectation, and I'm cool with that, is that I will go down on him at the end of the evening. And other women have discussed with me the same kind of thing, like, is this guy... In, in, in the film industry, this happens all the time, is this famous producer or director I'm about to meet or might meet or have a chance to meet, is he going to, if he spends time with me, if he invites me to go and have a drink with him at the Martinez Hotel, you know, uh, in Cannes, or the Carlton, the only place to stay, the only place I ever stayed in Cannes, uh, is he going to expect me then to come up to his room and um, give him a blowjob? So the blowjob as a, as a unit of exchange. And as a unit of exchange, like all units of exchange in capitalism, it loses something. It loses something. Is it an issue of surplus value? What is that thing that it loses? What does it lose? What does sex lose if it becomes a unit of exchange? Now, I'm going to say that people in the sex trade, and I am not going to put them down even for an instant, many of them enjoy their work, enjoy their work a heck of a lot more than people who uh, not just work in you know, McDonald's or Starbucks or places like that, but who work in offices. Office work, I once said in a previous episode, is all the same. There's no difference between one kind of office work or another. If you're the CEO of something, as I have been in several circumstances, you know, several contexts, it's a lot like being someone in a cubicle. Only you can close the door behind you if you're the CEO, and you can't close the door behind you if you're in a cubicle. Sad thing. All those people in cubicles. Give them a moment. Let's take our hats off and drink a toast to all the people in their cubicles today, doing their cuticles in their cubicles. But it's all the same. It's all the same. So everything becomes a unit of exchange, and it's sad. The system is sad. The system is sad. But back to what we have learned about the dynamics of hookup sex, learned from the research on that subject, and how, for example, women feel in the context when they are expected in a certain way to give men blowjobs on the second hookup. How do people end up feeling about that? Can people be damaged by that? Well, the studies show that, uh, that maybe people are generally positive about, about casual sex, overall about their casual sex encounters. Yeah, that's true. But the question is, in the, in the greater scheme of things, I think a significant number of people, women and men, have their egos damaged in that kind of situation. I mean, men, in particular, expect positive feedback from sex. I mean, there's a certain kind of guy who, as long as he penetrates and ejaculates... I'm not talking about orgasm here. We did a very popular episode on the male orgasm, and we're going to do more on the male orgasm in future episodes of this series. But as long as he penetrates and ejaculates in any orifice, that's good enough for him. It's like that old-time religion. It's good enough for him. And what the woman feels about it does, about this whole situation does not much matter to him, except, except, except he still expects positive feedback. It's bananas. It's Looney Tunes that a man would feel like that. 
It's nuts. Sometimes the woman does the does the same thing because she feels really insecure. A man has penetrated her and bumped and grinded. What's the what's the past tense of grind? For a while, and then there's a lot of heavy breathing on his part, and she's expected to do a bunch of heavy breathing too, because that's that's the deal. And then he ejaculates and he rolls off of her and uh, as we mentioned before in old fashioned movies he would smoke a cigarette but I mean that's about it there's no tenderness necessarily coming from him if it is it's kind of by by rote sometimes as I say sometimes he will say was that was that good for you was that as good for you as it was for me and all that kind of kind of stuff and the woman will say things to you oh oh did you did you like that? Did you enjoy that? And it's like bananas. One thing that we talked about in our recent episode was that the greatest change in sexuality in the 20th century was the increasing amount of oral sex that takes place. It was like 11% or something, according to the Kinsey Report in around 1950, which is kind of really shockingly low. And then, as researchers and commentators have told us, it just went up rapidly since then. This raises the question of how many men really know how to give a woman oral sex. They don't even think about it. They're just down there, you know, blah, 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 licking away or sucking away, whatever. Uh, they, don't, they don't know a thing. Let's just talk about the G-spot. All the G-spot is, is the internal nerves, subcutaneous nerves, if you want to call them that, inside nerves of the clitoris. That's what the G-spot is anatomically. People speak about the G-spot as if it's some kind of mystical or emotional, we'll say, thing deep down inside the female. No, it's, it has a physical presence. As we've said in almost every episode of this podcast, the body and the mind are the same thing. Yea, verily, I say unto you. And then one actually has to look at, as we have done in several episodes, the whole issue of deep vaginal orgasm. The best kind of orgasm for a woman is deep vaginal orgasm. Yeah, you know, clitorally induced orgasm is fine, but the best kind of orgasm, the most satisfying kind of orgasm, the most fulfilling kind of orgasm for a woman, and we're going to do more about this, is deep vaginal orgasm. But in order for a woman to experience deep vaginal orgasm, other than with, may I say, a long vibrating dildo, is with a man with a long penis. And not that many men have really long enough penises in order to give women the deep vaginal orgasm that they really, really want and need and should have. So that's the deal. And men, men, interesting category of human beings. We did another episode that's gotten a huge amount of feedback. And that episode was called The Death of the Goddess which was about the origins of misogyny. And man, did I get a lot of feedback from that episode. The relationship between monotheism, the worship of one God, and the whole idea that there's a male God out there, or implicitly male God out there. And by the way, in a certain sense, even the Buddha is implicitly a male God deity. I'm going to be speaking in my next episode more about the origins of Tantra and the presence of the yoginis in Tantra, which allows, or at least in the old days, in the old days, a thousand years ago, allowed very much for the female as being the source of so many forms of advancement for the male and the source of so many cultural and intellectual advancement until, until this was interesting because this all took place in the context of the transition of 
of uh, of India away from Buddhism back to Hinduism, which is a phen- phenomenon of the 12th century, whatever, whatever, and uh, Buddhism being male-oriented more than Hinduism was. And that's neither here nor there. What am I talking about? Oh, yes. I said in an episode something very controversial, and I don't know if anyone liked it, but it's an important thing to say, and that is, in coming, you won't call it orgasm, we'll simply call it coming, the woman experiences triumph, and the man experiences defeat. All he's done is spurted and squirted away, resulting in a feeling of a certain degree of exhaustion, and yet he is expected immediately within the next 20 minutes to be able to get hard, become tumescent, get an erection, and do it all over again. That's what he's expected to do. Part of my theory of misogyny is that under the surface, men have felt for a very, very long time that there's this individual in their lives or individuals, this category of people in their lives called women whom they are not able to satisfy by the kind of sex you're told you're supposed to have, penetration sex, no matter how long they last. There's this kind of myth, if you want to call it that, that if men last a long time, this is inevitably going to give women a great orgasm. Well, if they have long penises, that could be true. It's probably true. But if they're average guys, one questions whether or not, and one knows from talking to men, because I get a lot of feedback from men on this particular issue. In the unconscious mind, there is this feeling of inadequacy that women give to men, simply because it's implicit in the whole arrangement. Men feel afterwards that the woman is not satisfied, that there is a level of ecstasy that a woman can achieve through sex that her man is not capable of giving her. One of the research topics that we did in in a previous episode, which I found particularly interesting, they had women and men approaching women on, this was college age research, but I think there was also older age research done on a similar topic. And that is that the, so these uh, researchers, these, uh, you know, research associates would approach women on campus and some of the research associates were men and some of them were, were women. And what was really interesting is that a woman who is approached by another woman assumes or is more likely to assume that the woman will be sexually competent and sexually skilled. But if she's approached by a man, approached in a way like a come on, if you want to call it that, she will assume that he is not sexually competent and sexually skilled. So this is the framework against which we are operating. The purpose of sex, what is it? And we're going to be talking about this a lot. We're going to be talking about this a great deal. They say that sex is an important factor in how people evaluate their marriages, their long-term relationships, whatever. But how good is that sex? All these studies that say couples of such and such an age and such and such an ethnicity are statistically shown to have sex five times a month as opposed to other ages, whatever, and they have sex more or less often. 
and then there are also interesting studies, and we're going to be going into those in terms of the instigation of sex, in terms of how many times, for example, the man wishes to instigate sex and the woman is not interested. You know, the usual kind of, you know, I've got a headache deer, as they'd say in old films. But I think the most important thing is that if sex is so important in a relationship, as people say in research studies and questionnaires, and then the sex is not that satisfying, we have a weird situation going on. What can you do? What can you do? Well, there are many things. People uh, talk about Tantra, which we've talked about before with a wonderful guest, Anita Di Francesco. And I'm going to be talking about the history of tantric sex and, and rituals very shortly, and the history of those in an upcoming podcast that I think everyone's going to want to listen to. That episode is going to be dynamite. Yes, dynamite. But we're left in this weird kind of kind of situation. This odd kind of situation as far as sex is concerned. What does one do? What is the status of sex in marriage? I just asked that same question. So we're going to be delving into the research on this quite a bit. As I've also said before, I'm re repeating myself, in upcoming episodes of Explore Ecstatic Sensuality. But I think the main topic is do not allow sex to ruin your self-esteem, to ruin your ego. That's not the role it should play in life. And I'm now going to turn that on its head and say the other is equally true. Do not rely on sex for your self-esteem. Both women and men do this. Men especially, but also women. Men wanting to put notches in their belts and walk around with the concept that they're great lovers and that women are all over them and all this sort of malarkey, balderdash. Yeah, it, it, this may sound like something that men did in a previous generation, but there are guys out there who still do it. And women who, again, put a lot of their self-esteem on the concept of being sexy and desirable, not just beautiful, but specifically, specifically around the notion that they are sexy and desirable. And if you take that away, in some cases, there's not that much left. So in no case should anyone allow their lover or their wife or their husband to feel bad about their sexuality. That's really, really important. And if your lover or your spouse is making you feel bad about your sexuality, they are hitting you where you are most vulnerable. That is the spot where everyone is most vulnerable. A spouse can put you down for being even a bad father, but a spouse can put you down for not getting the promotion that uh, you had suggested that you were going to get so that you can afford the house or the vacation or whatever that you've been talking about. You know, a man is put down for that. A woman is put down, can be put in this world, can be put down for something similar. They were expecting that their joint income was going to be enough to do X, Y, and or Z. And all of a sudden she's not, she gets fired. She's had to take a lower paying job and they can't do it. There's all kinds of this, what I call in a separate episode, soap opera stuff that goes on between, between women and men. But if anyone allows their spouse to put them down sexually, and this can be done subtly, this can be done by nuance, this can be done by inference, by implication, by invidious comparison to someone else. Oh, is that bad? That is like really terrible. There's a wonderful opera 
by my favorite composer, von Heute auf Morgen, uh, by Arnold Schoenberg, in which this kind of thing happens. A couple goes out and meets an ideally sexual couple, sexually ideal couple. And that couple becomes, for a while, the basis of a negative comparison for both. The handsome tenor is not as good as the husband, or, you know, the sexy woman is not as good as the wife. So they try to, the real husband and wife try to adopt those roles in order to become the sexy people. Yeah, this kind of stuff happens in real life. It wasn't Arnold Schoenberg and his wife, Max Blonda, who was really the librettist of this opera, who was, who was really Schoenberg's wife at the time, kind of interesting dynamic, but away from my usual preoccupation with modernist classical music. We'll save that for, for elsewhere. Don't let it happen. Don't put yourself in a situation where that kind of thing becomes inevitable. Don't do it. Women do it and men do it. They walk into it. It's a kind of masochism to walk into a situation where you kind of know that you're going to be put down sexually. Put down in terms of even not having a good enough body, that kind of deal. Don't put, it's, it's one thing for your spouse to encourage you to be better. That's a good thing. It's one thing for your spouse to encourage you to be better sexually. It is a particularly good thing for your spouse to tell you explicitly, not implicitly, verbally, with words, what you should be doing to please them, what you should be doing so that you can achieve better sex. And there's a whole bunch of things, different sexual contexts, you know, going somewhere and, and having sex in another location other than the bedroom in the little two-in-one house where you live, wherever that may be. All kinds of different things. There is, in fact, polyamory. We did a wonderful episode on polyamory where swapping... One thing I discovered is how many people over 70 do swapping. I mean, I'm 30 years away from that, but I, you know, swapping is a big deal and an interesting deal. An interesting deal because then you can go back to your quote-unquote regular relationship to your marriage with new ideas. People have to realize that sex is a learning experience. And what do you want to learn? What is it that we want to learn through sex? Do I want to learn how great I am? Bear. Do I want to, I don't know, learn what kind of mattress I should be lying on to have, have sex? No, I want to be learning about how to have pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Such an important word. How to have and to give pleasure. And how pleasure can be mutual and shared by myself and my lover and not a one-sided deal. Boy, men have to learn this tremendously. But also also some, some women. So... These are all such critical and crucial, crucial things. Because, again, to wrap up this episode and go back to what we were talking about at, at the beginning, do not allow sex in any of its manifestations to ruin your self-esteem. That is not what it's there for. Particularly, as I said, in this era of hookups, where sex comes to the fore in, we'll call them relationships, simply meaning not relationships, as in relationships as it's generally defined. We're talking about simply interactions. We're going to call them interactions and not relationships. Sex has come to the fore in interactions. And for a lot of people, this is a good thing because we live in an era where a lot of people have something to hide. People have a persona that they want to keep up. People don't want to let their barriers down. There's a kind of fear that runs through society, and it comes through the political situation and the world situation in which we live in, that's for sure. But we're brought up with this kind of fear, the feeling that somehow we're not good enough, 
the gulf between the haves and the have-nots, but I mean, that's a silly old-fashioned expression, the gulf between people who make $300,000 a year and their psychology and people who make $50,000 a year is greater than ever in terms of what you can do, not only that, but how you feel about yourself. If you're going through life making half a million a year, you're feeling pretty good, you know. If you go through life feeling making 50 grand a year, when a relationship, in the other sense of the word, is really too expensive for you. In reality, it's really too expensive for you. Take a woman out to a nice dinner, you know, it's $250. That's a lot of money if you're making 50 k a year. That's just how it is. This is reality. So people have a lot to hide. They hide, sometimes men hide, by overspending in relationships. Yes, it's true. I hear this all the time from men. Uh, in response to my, to my podcast, in response to this podcast... I was just going to say one more thing. We're talking about how frequently people have sex. Golly, I remember... Did you hear the car horn? Golly, I remember being in a relationship where the basic premise of the deal is that we had sex every night. It was good sex. We learned to understand... The relationship was kind of not necessarily that great. It was with someone who always had to be right and be told she was right at the end of every conversation. You can't be with somebody like that. But as far as the sex was concerned, I remember we were, uh, I was going to the Sundance Film Festival, that being my business, and I had this nice kind of sweet, right above Park Avenue, you know, right near the main theaters there, etc., where films are shown in competition, which I uh, had quite a number over the years. And... Uh, a woman I was uh, involved with uh, showed up. But I should say, there was a kind of bedroom area, but then a guy we knew in the company, nice guy, gay guy, was sort of, you know, holding up, holding out in the other, other area, the sort of reception area where we also had a television because we were selling films there, whatever. So my woman friend shows up, and we close the door behind us, and she was, gives me a nice gift a great big huge Latin dictionary which I absolutely loved and you know we went at it this is the same woman I had sex with every night which I've done with other women too and it's like it was we both felt like doing the full thing it's it's like you know you're going in and somebody offers you the full menu you know one of those things prefix and it's like all kinds of stuff. You know, you have starters and, and, and all, a lot of, a lot of, so many courses. Mm, mm, mm. So we did the whole thing. And uh, it was nice. And, but it didn't de-energize us at all. Interestingly enough, we went off to screenings after that, separate screenings and parties, and we saw each other. You know, it didn't, it's, it was the kind of deal where the sex, it wasn't like exhaustion sex. <gasps> it's all over. It was like energizing sex, a good kind of sex. And uh, at one time, I think later that day, the, our gay friend, gay fellow who did some things with, with, with the company said, you know, I didn't know that straight people had such a good time. <laughs> and that was just so, that was just so, that was just so great. I'm going to close with, with one thought and... My LGBTQ and uh, related listeners and friends may just, you know, kick me in the balls for saying this, but I think that sex among straight people, heterosexuals, is becoming a lot more like gay sex. Now, by sex, I mean, I think gay people, I know, gay people have hooked up rather than dated. In a certain way, hooking up, the hookup culture was pioneered by gay people. It's, it's interactions in which sex is to the fore. Okay? And it's still the case, although it's funny. I was uh, 
talking to a friend. The same friend was by this morning with the, the New Yorker issue, and she was going off to a business which was run by a gay couple, and he's like in his uh, guys in his eighties, and his quote unquote younger guy, who's probably like I don't know, in, really in his fifties, but is dyeing his hair because his older lover likes it that way, likes him to have black hair. So what? And they've been, you know, he, the older guy met his lover when he was a, a teenager, and they've been together ever since. And it's just like this wonderful relationship, a dreamy relationship. But um, it, these things all, in the gay world often begin in more of a hookup culture situation. So gay people were the pioneers of this. And in a certain way, we're just adjusting. Even though hookup culture has been around and has supplanted dating over the course of the last 20 years, actually a little longer than that in a certain sense, this is, we're still sort of adjusting to that, to that whole notion of sex being to the fore and charm, you know, is no longer such a big deal as it might well as it was in the in the old days and coming up with things to say to entice or get your the object of your interest the object you know of your mind at any given or your eyesight of any given point to uh, pay attention to it i i do it with my eyes a lot it's interesting there's a woman friend, former woman friend at this point, sadly, and she said to me on any number of occasions, stop looking at me like that. And she was shivering just because of the fact that, uh, and we're going to talk about this in one of our com upcoming episodes. If you're a woman or a guy, you can really do that. It's fun. It's fun. For me to look at a woman and feel her shiver and women really like that you know okay there's some you know you can a guy can tell if he's smart a guy can tell who might be quote unquote receptive maybe the wrong word to that kind of thing all this is fascinating there's so many ways to feel good about yourself by sexual interactions that's one of the ways you can do it that's one of the ways that you can feel good about yourself rather than use a, to use a technical term shitty feeling shitty about yourself is not a good thing sex sexual interaction the chemistry the vibrations the electricity that can pass between between men and women if that's your thing or between women and women and men and men if that's your thing or if a combination of the above are your thing, the amount of electricity that can happen that's energizing, that makes you feel great about yourself, that makes you feel enthusiastic about yourself, that makes you feel that there are doors about to open in your life all the time, that there's fun and thrills and dancing to be done in this world. There's expression to be done in this world. There are triumphs to be had in this world. Sex should be a part of that. And if sex drags any of that down, if sex drags your potential down, and if relationships drag your potential down, and if this whole process of the hookup culture drags you down, and if somehow, you know, you're not getting any, a <laughs> famous old story, if you're not getting any, and that drags you down. There are so many ways that sex, broadly defined, can drag you down. Well, I'm going to get really rude here. Fuck that shit. Fuck that shit. And on these enlightening words and extremely subtle way of speaking, I'm going to call an end to this kind of special little episode of Explore Ecstatic Sensuality. Thank you.